I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Overnight on Thursday, Russia attacked a nuclear power plant. We weigh up just how dangerous that could be, and explain how TikTok became a weapon in the Russia-Ukraine war. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, my colleagues from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground are bringing you the latest news and analysis on the unfolding crisis in Ukraine. It's day nine. And today, I'm joined by the Telegraph's defence and security editor, Dominic Nichols, and our deputy foreign editor, Theo Mers. So I think we'd better start with the uh, most important military updates overnight and this morning. Theo and Dom, do you want to take this? Why don't we start with the battle at uh, Zaporizhia, the, the nuclear plant? What happened there? So Zaporizhia, the nuclear plant to the south of the country, near the, the area of Russia's most successful advances so far, came under attack last night. There are very striking images on online of the battle there, uh, which resulted in a fire in some of the buildings. We, the, the fire is now reported as out. But what we can see from the, the footage is... Uh, firstly, small arms fire. And secondly, we can also see car alarms going off, which indicates some form of there must have been an explosion of some sort to create the pressure wave to to set car alarms off. But also this very arresting image of of a of a bright light landing, which I'm convinced is is not a uh, not an artillery round because it or a missile because it would have caused uh, huge destruction. I think that's an illumination flare, which would have been used as part of the attack for the for the assaulting troops to see what was going on. It does literally, you know, it is a it is a very large flare. Usually artillery delivered can be mortar delivered, um, but uh, the fact that it lands and burns for a couple of seconds on the ground before uh, before going out suggests that it's not a munition that has uh, n- not malfunctioned. I think that's an illumination round. So we should be very concerned by this, I think, because it's a nuclear facility and it just indicates the, uh, as we've discussed over the last couple of days, just the level of risk that um, that the Russian forces are prepared to take. And before I move on to any of the other any of the other updates, Theo, I wonder if you wanted to come in there to talk about the, the wider implications of, of this attack on the plant. Theo? Um, obviously, it, it's very concerning worldwide. And we've seen a Ukrainian MP today saying that Europe has to act now, NATO has to act now, it has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in in her words, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole the whole continent. Um, and there's a lot of, of fear from the Ukraine side that this could be a second Chernobyl, which obviously is is in Ukraine and was a huge disaster for them and the rest of the continent. And as this is happening, we're seeing the rhetoric from the NATO side uh, stepping up, the, obviously before uh, the Russian invasion. And even in the, the first days, the first week of the Russian invasion, NATO, Biden, other Western leaders have repeatedly said, we're not going to get involved. We're not going to, we're going to protect our allies, but there's no chance that we're going to become involved militarily in Ukraine. And uh, Ben Wallace, our defence secretary, has said uh, we're, we're not going to impose a, a no-fly zone as recently as yesterday, I think. But n- now that w- we're talking about this risk to a, a nuclear facility and this idea that it could pose a, a real danger to countries a- across the border, the rhetoric is is certainly changing um, and there may be a, a change in action in, in some way, but we don't know exactly how that is going to change yet. So can I just ask both of you, if it's this dangerous and this reckless a thing to do, why why on earth would they want to do it in the first place? What's the strategic and tactical ad- advantage here? Well, to my mind, there's there's very little tactical advantage. But in terms of strategic advantage, I think you've just hit the nail on the head there, David. They do it because it's so shocking, because it, it captures our attention. It uh, maintains the initiative with them. It, it, they're setting the pace now. We are in diplomatic terms, playing catch up. And it just shows the level they're prepared to go to. All these signals, the, the, the way that Putin and Lavrov have talked about nuclear weapons in the recent days, these are all signs to NATO and to anyone outside of Ukraine just to back off, to stay away. This is not your fight. We're all expected to just 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 watch whilst Russia does whatever it wants to do in Ukraine. So it's an extremely reckless act. We should be concerned. I mean, bearing in mind they 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 took the site of Chernobyl very early on in the in the war last week, and there were initial signs of, of radiation levels were going up. But that was that was explained as 
just the, the sheer number of people and vehicles and movement in the area that was kicking up dust and earth and, and hence the, the numbers went up. And then it, it leveled off after that. So I don't think Russia see any any sort of tactical advantage here. I don't see them as trying to trying to destroy it in any way. Um, I see them as trying to use it as a stranglehold over Ukraine. So they may move against the other sites, the other four, the other three sites. I think that the Ukraine have of nuclear facilities. But I think it is a is a massive sign to the West just to just to back off. And, and as I say, it maintains the strategic initiative in their favour as they see it. So that's the attack on the nuclear plant. Um, what else should we know? about last night, the past 24 hours, and, and this morning, uh, Dom? So continued shelling in Kiev and across the north and the east. So Kharkiv and uh, Chernikov were, were hit again repeatedly. 33 reported dead in the tower block in, in Chernikov. And there was uh, there's that incredible dash cam footage of what looks like a cluster munition or, or a, a large number of munitions landing at, almost simultaneously in a street, in a populated street. There's, there's seemingly no military target there at all. So civilians are still taking an, an absolute pounding by the Russian forces. In the south, uh, Mariupol, again, is, is also under extreme bombardment, power and water cut off, we are told, although the latest defence intelligence from the British MOD uh, released this morning says that Mariupol itself is still in Ukrainian hands but is effectively cut off. There has been no more sighting of this this alleged Russian amphibious assault group that we saw off the uh, south coast of, the, of Ukraine yesterday. However, it looks like uh, Russian forces have reached a town on the on the on the Bug River just to the north um or sort of northwest of Mariupol which is which is the route through to Odessa so it, if there's no amphibious assault it looks as though they are they are keen to take the entire south part of the country um effectively making Ukraine a landlocked country if at the end of this Ukraine is still exists as a as a separate country but going after all the the industrial areas and um, and the ports along along the south now the Ukrainians did they repelled uh, an assault to the west of Kyiv. Russia is still very keen to to try and move around from Kyiv is effectively encircled now from the west through the north to the east, um, and the Russians are trying to trying to sort of close it off to the south as well. But there was a battle yesterday where the Ukrainians were successful in repulsing them from the west west of the city, and, and so I think what what we're seeing is it, it's a sort of race. You've got to show Putin that the, the cost of continuing is worse than the cost of of ceasing what he's got and negotiating now so uh, others will be able to talk to the um the economic aspect and the domestic internal russian side of it but seemingly on the ground the the things that are having a real effect are the anti-tank missiles and the anti-air missiles particularly the anti-tanks some very very old kit that is defeating very new russian armor um so the more that that flows in and the more that the movement on the ground is able to be stopped and repulsed and, and perhaps even pushed back it just it's just raising the costs for putin now that might mean that he lashes out even more again at, at these uh, nuclear facilities or we've even heard lavrov bring biological weapons into the conversation they just drop these little things in knowing the incendiary nature that they have on our conversation we need to be very concerned i think with boris johnson talking about this attack being an attack on europe it, it is a very very troubling day today Extremely troubling indeed. I think we all agree with you. Theo, you've been looking at the latest news and reaction from Russia. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? What's been happening? Yes, well, it follows on from what Dom was saying, really, about the domestic situation there. Last night, we had some really worrying language from Putin. He said he claimed that the invasion was all going to to plan, uh, despite reports of huge number of Russian casualties and problems with their equipment there and the suggestion, um, certainly from what our correspondents have been seeing and reports elsewhere, that this is not going to plan for, for Russia. And he also said that he's never going to give up on his belief that Russians and Ukrainians are one people, which suggests he's going to follow this this invasion, what they call in Russia a special military operation, until until the end. And he's he's not going to back down whatever the language or whatever the threats from from the West are. And then in terms of Russian politics, we've seen some really worrying developments today. We knew they were coming, but it's just been passed into law or just passed the upper house of the Russian parliament. It still needs to be signed off by Putin, but I'm sure he will do this, that Russians and indeed foreigners in, in Russia can be jailed for up to 15 years for spreading fake news about the war 
And um, that's extremely worrying given what the Russian definition of, of real news about the war is. I, they've been saying that Ukrainians are, are bombing their, their own cities or, or staging attacks to, to bring in the West or that NATO is, is faking these reports of, of Russian aggression. So essentially it means that if you report accurately on the war in Russia, you're at, you're at great personal risk. And for this reason, a number of journalists, both independent Russian journalists and some foreign correspondents, have been leaving the country and are leaving the country today or um, left the country yesterday, knowing that this uh, was going to come in, which is bad in itself. It's terrible for the for the Russian people. And it's really worrying that it means that there's not going to be this independent and accurate news and we we uh, found out overnight that the websites of the BBC in Russia and Medusa, a very good uh, independent media outlet, among other uh, foreign and independent sources, have been blocked or, or restricted in, in Russia. So this really means that Russian people who remain in the country are going to have a much more limited idea of what is really happening in Ukraine and this happened this is coming as state media is really ramping up its propaganda to justify Putin's Putin's actions there so that that's the that's the scene in in Moscow at the moment and Dom you said that some of the logic behind attacking the nuclear plant was to tell the west to back off um, we've seen reaction in the US today. Um, I think it was Lindsey Graham who said that, who asked if there was a Brutus in Russia who'd kill Vladimir Putin to end the invasion. W- what does that kind of intervention tell us? Is it, is it useful at all um, or is it just downright unhelpful? Yeah, so this is a, the senior US Senator uh, Lindsey Graham who was saying, oh, how, how is this going to end? Someone's got to step up to the plate, take this guy out. Is there a Brutus in Russia? You know, obviously referring to one of the uh, assassins of, of Julius Caesar. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, really, this is really helpful stuff for Vladimir Putin, I mean, it's, it's it's not helpful at all to the cause of Ukraine and NATO and, and the West. This is exactly the inflammatory language that Putin not only wants to hear, but he believes he's hearing all the time. But th- they can now point to, they can now put this out on all their uh, media channels and say, there you go, told you, this is the NATO plan all along. Here we go, one of the most senior guys in US politics talking like this. It's just extraordinary. And I can't imagine what he thought he was achieving by it, unless he's playing to domestic politics, perhaps, but you would have thought somebody of that gravitas would would be able to lift his lift his eyes a bit. So no, not at all helpful, helpful for anyone um, outside the Kremlin, I'd suggest. I, I don't know, Theo, if you want to come in on that as well and um, potentially talk a little bit about uh, NATO's reaction today. We've had uh, Anthony Blinken saying that NATO is ready for a conflict, speaking alongside the Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg. What are the movements in NATO today? We've had those, we've had those comments from, from Blinken. And then there's going to be a meeting between all the EU foreign ministers, uh, Blinken, Dmitry Kulieva, the Ukrainian foreign, foreign minister, and Liz Truss this afternoon. So there, there may be more clarity from that. I think that's something that's going to become clearer throughout the day picking up on what dom said about this this comment from the us about assassinating putin this of course has already been picked up in in the russian media and by russian officials sort of with with predictable disbelief saying that this is an this is an act of terrorism or a call for terrorism and and does as dom has said feed into this idea of russia under attack and there, well, there is a, a suggestion that Moscow is about to bring in martial law on top of these, or a a suspension of civilian law on top of the the laws that it's already brought in, sort of restricting freedom of speech. And that would be a a serious worsening of the situation for for people in the country. It would likely mean that the, the borders would be closed going in and out. It would expand the scope of military conscription. So I'd possibly expanding the the scope of the the offensive in Ukraine. The justification for that within Russia is this idea that sort of we are the ones under attack by the West. So they will certainly be looking to to amp up any of those comments as, or ramp up as many of those comments as, as much as possible to be able to to justify that to a 
domestic audience. Uh, Dom, I can see you want to add something. Uh, just very quickly, if I could say, uh, just highlight what Secretary of State Anthony Blinken did say today with NATO Secretary General. He made some very pertinent points. He said, NATO is a defensive alliance. We don't want conflict. But if the conflict comes to us, we're ready for it. We will protect every inch of NATO territory. Now, that last line, we will protect every inch of NATO territory, I think is very, very telling. Because there's a lot of talk at the moment about no-fly zones and responsibility to protect and what the West and NATO and other forces should do here. And Secretary Blinken there, with that line, we will protect every inch of NATO territory, is underlining yet again that we're not at the level where NATO is seriously considering doing anything militarily. I think that was yet again another message, possibly to Russia, but certainly for the domestically, as in the Western alliance, that, uh, that we're not there yet. NATO is not yet giving serious consideration to doing anything. If you grew up in the Cold War, chances are that you had the fear of nuclear war drilled into you by leaflets and apocalyptic public information films. In today's war in Ukraine, it's playing out on social media. Seconds-long clips are being shared in real time on platforms like TikTok and the messaging app Telegram. A quick scroll on the former uncovers a new type of content. Snappy videos telling young people how a nuclear war might play out and what they could do to survive it. And the politicians are logging on too. To discuss the new frontier of the conflict, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Sophie Tano, who spoke to Verity Bowman from our foreign desk and the Telegraph special correspondent, Harry de Ketville. Sophie started by asking Verity how video app TikTok is affecting how the world is viewing this war. So what we're seeing is this conflict developing live in front of us. So in the past, while Iraq in 2003 became known as the first live TV war and the Arab Spring was defined by Twitter, Ukraine has become the first TikTok war. We're getting an insight because of the sheer scale of content out there. It's on TikTok, it's on Twitter, it's on Instagram. There are thousands of videos of this conflict developing live. We're seeing troops move to the front line and that's military equipment traveling through villages and towns in Russia. We've seen videos of bombardments, explosions, and the aftermath of shelling. So in a recent scroll, I found diary-like videos of Ukrainians recording their escape. You know, one showed a girl packing her bag, pushing through crowds at a station, and saying goodbye to her dad at the border. Another one is a British father on his journey from Manchester to Ukraine to save his family. And all of this content I saw in about 15 minutes of scrolling on the app. Mm. Harry, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, clearly the last 20 years have totally transformed the battlefield. And, you know, I remember covering the war in Iraq and when the mobile phone networks went down, it it became very hard to know what was going on. And these days, the idea of not having any idea what goes on on a battlefield feels odd. Well, for, for the entire history of human civilization until now, that's been the norm. And this kind of diarization that we just heard about is just is just absolutely incredible. And I, I would say that it it works on the other way as well. Uh, in the last 10, 15 years, investigators and what are called open source intelligence analysts are able to piece together through all these diaries, through all these snapshots, these individual posts on social media, real time understanding and extremely sophisticated. I mean, investigations that would rival national state intelligence agencies' efforts into understanding troop movements, uh, military build-ups, all the kind of stuff that you would expect the, you know, the CIA to be doing or MI6 to try and understand. And, and, and people are now being able to do that through these kinds of posts. So it's a totally new development in warfare. Social media, I think it's fair to say, has also been rife with misinformation. For example, videos claiming to be from the current invasion of Ukraine that are instead from conflicts there in 2014 or from different conflicts entirely. Is it wise for people to turn to social media as a new source or should the videos be taken with a pinch of salt? Verity, perhaps you could answer that first. Yeah, well, we're getting a load of content and we're learning a lot from these videos, but we should definitely be cautious. Some of them are actually fake and we do need to be very careful verifying them. You know, sometimes we can even work out from a video that it's got a different soundtrack to the one recorded. Or we could look at the video's metadata, which is used to learn information about a specific video and it's embedded directly into it. So this can show when and where a video was recorded and whether it has the original sound. So one video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region 
in footage released by local authorities. It shows a military vehicle towing a car that's allegedly packed with explosives, where it was threatening evacuating citizens. But actually, the metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Harry, do you have anything to add to that question? Yes, I think the important thing is to say that we're not going to turn this back. You know, even if the uh, social media and the internet flooded with fake images or uh, dubious imagery which predates the current conflict, it's, you're not going to stop it. And what the, what will happen, and I'm sure what is happening, is that audience sophistication grows up. So, just as I remember one person describing to me the advent of Photoshop, that that sort of picture editing software in the fashion industry. And it totally transformed covers of celebrity magazines and the way people looked with sort of airbrushing on magazines. But that was never turned back. What happened is that audiences became accustomed to such images and realised that people didn't really have legs that looked like that and were sort of airbrushed for anything. And the sophistication grows up in the audience. And so I think this time as well, you know, audiences will go more sophisticated and realise that they can't always trust what they see. Yeah, definitely. I have another example of that, that a video was actually seen by 27 million people on TikTok. And it claims to show Russian paratroopers jumping from a plane over Ukraine. But there's actually no evidence that Russians conducted an airborne invasion. So it's pretty easy to disprove these things a lot of the time. Do you think that social media has also contributed to scaremongering and exaggeration of, for example, the threat of nuclear war during this invasion? Oh, um, definitely. There's loads of upsides to TikTok teaching young people, but we've got to be really cautious of it. So, you know, if you grew up in the Cold War, you probably had the fear of nuclear war drilled into you. But what we're seeing at the minute is Gen Zer feeling this worry, but it's all caused by TikTok. We're seeing videos of young people being told about how a nuclear war would go down, how they could survive it. And one video shows a simulation of what would happen if a nuclear bomb hit London. But experts say that these videos are actually downright misleading and they're sensationalising content and they don't always have the right details. Harry, you have reported on how Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been using the social media age to his advantage during this conflict. And we've seen him appeal to the public via handheld smartphone footage. How is he proving to be a master of the modern communication age? I think it's important to realise that that's all he can do right now. I mean, his situation is incredibly dire at the moment. He moves from place to place in Kyiv. He's aware that he's a target for assassination. You know, he barely sees the sunlight. And yet somehow he's got to both galvanise his nation as a fighting force and constantly cajole the Western world into providing support. And when you're in that sort of situation, with almost no communications, because you know satellite phones can be traced and you can make you a target for a missile strike. So it's very hard. You know, almost the only way you can do it is via Twitter, you know, via Facebook post. And that he has always been very good at. Let's remember this is a man who started off his career as a comedian as an actor who was constantly in his days in show business before becoming president, used social media, knows how to whip up a social media audience. He's an expert at this. And now it's not just a case of him wanting to do it. He has to do it. It's the only way he can do it. And on every front from promoting Ukraine's you know, membership of NATO or the EU, demanding no-fly zones, drawing attention to Russian strikes on nuclear facilities. Every time he's very swiftly there putting out another tweet, another video. And it's remarkably effective because what it does, as every institution of authority knows, social media cuts out the middleman. Instead of you know having to talk to a journalist to get your message across to people, Zelensky can go directly to his people. He can speak directly to the Russian people in fluent Russian, as he does. Of course, he's a Russian speaker. His Ukrainian, in fact, is much worse than his Russian. So he can address his people, the Russian people, the EU, world leaders, fighters on the front line, directly face to face, and they feel the warmth of his charisma. He is clearly a very charismatic individual. I also think he's undergone a remarkable transformation. You know, when he took office in 2019, people thought he was soft, uh, naive, and if push came to shove against the sort of cold-eyed assassin of Vladimir Putin, there'd only be one winner. Well, 
you know, we're seeing a different side to things now. He's undoubtedly been incredibly brave. He's undoubtedly put himself on the line. He's incredibly empathetic, and uh, that goes down very well on social media. People feel that he's speaking to them. And also, he has this remarkable capacity to see the funny side of things. You know, yesterday at this grim press conference in his bunker, basically, someone said to him, aren't you like Churchill, you know, standing up alone? And he said, yeah, well, you know, I think uh, Churchill drank a bit more than I do. You know, he, he, can, he can always see the funny side of things. It's a remarkable talent. He's proved himself in the cauldron, in the fire. He's been not found wanting. And uh, who of us could say that we would behave the same? So Kiev's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, he's another former celebrity who's taken up the information war. And we've seen him appeal to the entire world to help stop the Russian invasion in short clips uploaded to social media. How has Klitschko been using Telegram, which is a messaging app similar to WhatsApp, during the conflict? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the role of social media, how they stood up, is absolutely novel. So the way that... uh, Facebook and uh, other platforms have been very aggressive in in shutting down misinformation. They have effectively taken a side in this war, which they've never done before. Until recently, Facebook's attitude was, if it clicks, it's great. You know, it wins. That doesn't matter sort of really what's going on on the platform. Zuckerberg in the past has been very clear that he doesn't want to take down Holocaust denials, even though he's Jewish himself, because he thinks, you know, people have a right to spout stuff, even if it's arrant nonsense. But that's changed in this case. And we're seeing social media sites take a a stand. Telegram's very interesting, which you mentioned Klitschko using, because it's actually a Russian-owned site. A Russian started a messaging service. It's based outside of Russia, but lots of people use it because they think it's much more secure than WhatsApp. That's debatable. It's not as end-to-end encrypted in the same way that WhatsApp is encrypted, but it does give that veil of, of security. People are making their own decisions about what messaging services they use for whatever confidentiality they need. I, I would point out, you know, yesterday I went to see the Ukrainian ambassador in London and the extent to which the information war is taking place is incredible. Even here, you know, the staff at the Ukrainian embassy are too almost living in a bunker. Their communications with Kyiv are, are practically down. Establishing a secure line is very hard talking to the president is extremely difficult. And this is a sort of MC where only um, a few weeks ago, only 10 days ago, the ambassador would simply WhatsApp his president. And Harry, you've also been reporting on Russia's so-called troll factories. Perhaps you could elaborate on what they actually are and how have they been spreading misinformation during the Ukraine conflict on social media platforms? The troll factories are a, a, a creation of long-standing in Russia, and effectively they're slightly at a, at a remove from the Kremlin, almost sort of freelancers, uh, but mobilised undoubtedly with official sanction, and they create chaos is their aim. So they will intervene in almost any debate where they think there might be a possibility of stirring discord in the West, in Russia's adversaries. It's part of a long-standing campaign of asymmetric warfare. Russia realises it can't stand up to the power of the West, but it can undermine the West by sowing discord. So on almost any subject, from race to gun rights to obviously Donald Trump to You know, at one point they tried seeing if they could stoke discord about Native American rights in America, but obviously with COVID over vaccination, that's been a huge bot effort, a troll effort to try and flood social media sites with provocative statements, disinformation about any subject which could be controversial. And clearly that has been the case this time around, suggesting that the West is really responsible for this invasion, that, you you know, Russia's not invading at all, that, you know, there are all kinds of suggestions that actually Russia's just going in to clear out sort of chemical and biological weapons sites the West has installed in, in Ukraine. It doesn't have to be true. It doesn't even have to sort of try to attempt to be true. But what it has to be is eye-catching, and then create a debate, and you create a debate, you create an argument, and the the sort of truth is lost in the in the bun fight, as it were. And that has been going on for a long time with these troll factories. Mm. Are there any final thoughts from either of you before we wrap up? Um, well, I think it's really important to say that we're probably seeing the most amount of content on social media than we've ever seen in a conflict before. And this can be really helpful, but I do think it's really important to take everything with a pinch of salt 
verify it yourself, check legitimate news outlets before you take any of this stuff at face value that you're seeing online. Thank you, Verity. Harry, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I I would simply say that social media has its upsides and it's been used uh, by Zelensky admirably. It also has its downsides in that what's flavour of the month today can be bottom of the charts tomorrow. And, you know, if this conflict transforms from the issue that grabs everybody's attention around the world, that's what's happened today. But tomorrow, if it turns into a grinding conflict, as happened with Syria, as happens across the Middle East, where things turn into slow, cold, nasty conflicts where thousands of people died. After all, that's been happening in the Donbass region since 2014. We mustn't take our eye off the ball. We mustn't become too short-termist, only gripped by social media's latest fad. We've got to keep watching. And I think that's a role that journalism can play and that social media sometimes doesn't. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine coverage, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first month free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm every day on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter. We are, unsurprisingly, at Telegraph to see what we're up to. If you found this show useful, follow Ukraine The Latest on your podcast app. And you can email us at podcasts at telegraph.co.uk if there's something you think we should be covering or a question you'd like us to answer. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Theodora Ludludis and Louisa Wells. And on Twitter, Sophie Coe.